Many years ago, a friend of mine who was a very experienced business owner said, Andy, always have an exit plan. At the time, I kind of brushed it under the carpet and thought, yeah, whatever. And it was only a few years later that I realized this was probably the most important piece of business advice I had ever been given. And in today's video, I'm gonna explain exactly why. Hiya folks, welcome back to the Small Business Toolbox. I'm Andy Mack and I've been involved with the small business community for pretty much my entire adult life. In that time, I've seen some pretty amazing things and some pretty horrific things as well. I'm not professing to be an expert on anything really, but if you're gonna take one thing away from this video, is in the world of self-employment and running your own business, be prepared for the unexpected. One way you can do that is by having an exit plan and in order to explain why this is so fundamentally important, I'm gonna tell you a little story about a friend of mine. I'm gonna change a few key facts to make them a little bit less identifiable. You'll know why in a minute, but the overall outcome is 100% true. So this friend of mine, we'll call him James, he set up in the world of self-employment about 20 years ago. He literally put everything on the line. He spent all of his life savings, he remortgaged his house, he was up to his ears in debt. All to build up his first little business selling drum kits. He didn't really sell drum kits, but if I told you what he actually sold, you'd easily be able to work out who this person was. And I kind of know enough about drum kits for this story to make a little bit more sense. Anyway, James had about three years of making pretty much no money whatsoever. Him and his partner got by because his partner was working two jobs and basically making up for the fact that James was trying to set this business up. It was very stressful, it was a lot of hard work and late nights, but eventually some green shoots started to show. His business became successful and he kind of hit the niche of selling drum kits to beginners. He never drew a wage and instead decided to reinvest everything back into the business to buy extra stock, better premises and all that sort of thing. Eventually, James wanted to start selling higher-end drum kits to appeal to the more professional market. The margins on the cheaper kits were just too low and he would continually have parents coming in with little Billy to try out a drum kit and they would find their favourite drum kit and then go off and buy it from Amazon for 10 quid less. By building the business up to sell pro-level gear, it meant that there were much better margins and he had a much better quality of customer as well. The only downside really was that it required a bit of extra technical expertise. James was already working 12 hour shifts himself, so he didn't really have time to take on any extra responsibilities. But he knew someone who would be a perfect fit to join him as a partner on his ever growing business. Once again, James reinvested everything he'd made in his self-employment years and his new business partner, we'll call him Paul, he also put in a good chunk of cash as well. So they both had skin in the game. Anyway, they set up a brand new limited company and did everything by the book. They invested in new business premises that were much more professional and they spent about £50,000 kitting the place out. Honestly, it was the best drum shop in a hundred mile radius. Over the years, the business grew really well. They were so proud of it and they'd signed deals with bigger and bigger manufacturers to exclusively hold their stock. A lot of these bigger companies would insist on quite a significant stock holding if you were even going to entertain working with them. So they borrowed another £200,000 to invest into the business to buy up all of this stock and that in turn would help them cater to this higher end market. Within a couple more years, the business was profitable and turning over about £500,000 a year. In fact, things were going so well that Paul and James finally decided to draw a small salary from the business. It was just minimum wage, but I mean, this was a milestone. They were actually now paying themselves. The countless hours of late nights and early mornings were starting to pay off, and they had a good little routine set up. Paul was the early starter. He would come in quite early, seven or eight in the morning, do all the technical stuff, get all the drum kits ready for collection or ready for shipping. James would handle the late shift, staying at the shop till eight o'clock at night to deal with customers coming in. Things were going really great and Paul and James were absolutely over the moon with the business. 
So one morning, James arrived at work, and it was a little bit of an odd one because he hadn't heard anything from Paul, and Paul was always the early starter, and James got there and Paul wasn't there. He tried calling him, it just went straight through to voicemail, he checked his emails, nothing. He checked the main inquiries mailbox, which Paul would always check first thing in the morning, and again, that hadn't been checked, it was full of unread messages. He checked the holiday calendar, again, nothing. Anyway, James was pretty busy and he had a few things to sort out, so he kind of put it to the back of his mind while he opened the post and replied to a few emails. And then his phone rang, and it wasn't Paul, but it was Paul's wife, and she wasn't in a good way. Paul had been out for his usual early morning run, and to cut a long story short, he got hit by a car and he was now in hospital and he was in critical condition. Things really weren't looking good and later on that day, Paul passed away. He was only in his late thirties and he had his whole life ahead of him. Anyway, I'll brush over the next few months because it was just chaos and pretty unpleasant really. Before Paul passed away, him and his wife were on the verge of a divorce and James really didn't get on with her. He tried a few times to speak to her about the business, but really didn't get anywhere. Paul's wife was more interested in going off on holiday with random people and didn't really seem that bothered about the mess that had been left behind. Meanwhile, the shop was rapidly filling up with half-built drum kits and James just didn't have the time to sort things out. He was single-handedly trying to keep the business afloat and because of all the debt, he had to keep the lights on. He was now working from 8am to 8pm every single day, weekends and everything. He didn't have any time off. He wasn't sleeping properly and the whole thing was a mess. He barely had time to catch up on paperwork. The business was profitable, but he didn't have time to do any of the kind of admin work that he used to do because he was now doing two people's jobs. He hadn't had a day off in best part of two years and things were really getting on top of him. Anyway, I'll cut to the chase because things got really messy. And to cut a long story short, obviously there were 50-50 shareholders of this company, but now that Paul had passed away, his shares had effectively become the property of Paul's wife, who James didn't get on with. His wife had nothing to do with the running of the business, but every bit of effort that James was putting into this, 50% of it was going to a person who he didn't even like. He offered to buy her out and try and buy the shares off her, but she wasn't having any of it. She was quite happy sitting there doing nothing, while James put all the effort into trying to keep the business afloat probably hoping that later down the line, these shares would be worth more money. It wasn't a scenario James or Paul had ever thought of and they'd never discussed it. And in the end, James was left with no option but to shut the business down. Years and years of work were just instantly lost. He had to sell off all the stock that he had at cost and he sold it to a competitor. And with the money that he got from that, he paid off most of the loans. There was a little bit left over, but he had to use that to buy himself out of the business lease that they'd signed up to. He felt sick to the pit of his stomach. Literally everything that he'd worked towards for the last, well, for pretty much his whole life as being a self-employed business owner, everything was gone. He'd lost a really good friend and he'd lost his business. The only thing he'd ever taken from himself was two months of minimum wage. As I say, I've anonymized this story quite a lot, but the overall premise of it is 100% true. And this sort of thing happens a lot more often than you would think. Half a day of preparation in the early stages of the business could have resolved this whole situation. But you know, sometimes when you're just getting things set up, that's the last thing in the back of your mind. And sometimes you tend to get lost off in the detail instead of looking at the bigger picture. For future reference, a simple one-page shareholders agreement would probably have been enough to sort this out, but it would have needed to have been signed by Paul and James when Paul was still alive. And all of this leads me neatly on to what this video is originally about. And it was that crucial bit of advice that I was given a long time ago. Andy, always have an exit plan. So an exit plan is simply a strategy for removing yourself or another person from a business at a later date in a controlled way. They're very typically referred to if you're ever going to sell your business, but I'm going to keep this as a much broader reaching strategy and have it as a general kind of thing to have at the back of your mind if you're self-employed or you're a director of a limited company, just always thinking, 
how would I get out of this later down the line if I needed to? Or what if someone else left the business? How would that work? What would it look like? The big thing that you need to remember is that if you are used to working a corporate job, working for the man, you can leave that job at any time. I mean, yes, you might have a notice period, but once you've worked out your notice period, that's it, you're gone, you never have to be in touch with them again. But self-employed life isn't really like that. It can be quite complicated to shut a business down, especially if you're in a partnership or you're a director of a limited company and there's more than one director. So I know this is going to sound like really the opposite of probably what you're going to think about when you're just setting up in business. But from the second that you set up your business, and especially if you're working with other people, have it at the back of your mind, how would I get out of this if I needed to? At least consider having an exit plan and then you're 99% ahead of everyone else. We'll talk more about what an exit plan might look like in a minute, but here's just a few of the things that you need to think about. This is particularly relevant if you're working as part of a partnership or a limited company with more than one shareholder. First of all, what happens if your business partner dies? I know this is a bit of a morbid subject and I think it's something that a lot of people just kind of pretend isn't going to happen, but eventually we all become worm food. So what is your plan if your business partner passes away? And tied into that, what if you die? What if you get hit by a bus? What happens to your shares in the company? Do you want them to be left for your family or do they get passed over to the remaining shareholders? You need to chat about that with your business partner or partners and work out how that's gonna work. Another one that comes up all the time, what if you or your business partner wants to leave the business and do something else? Let's say, for example, you've both heavily invested in the business, you've spent five years building things up, and one of you decides, well, you want to do something else. You want to move to a different country, or you've been given a really good job offer that you just can't turn down. How do you get out of the business? And another thing worth considering as well, okay, there might be, let's say, two of you who set the business up in the first place, but what if your business partner says, oh, I know this other guy, Joe Bloggs, he would be amazing for the business. Let's bring him in to work with us. And you're kind of thinking, well, yeah, okay, I don't really know him, but uh, yeah, okay, we could potentially bring him on board, but he wants to be a director and shareholder. Well, they would have to buy their way into the business. You can't just ignore the five years of work you've done building things up. You, you can't just give away a third of your ownership of the business to someone who you've never met for no recompense. And you can save a lot of arguments by deciding how that's gonna work at the start of proceedings rather than five years down the line. And another thing to consider is, well, how do you value the business? If you and your business partner are equally important and the business literally can't survive without one of you, and one of you either leaves or passes away or you're deciding to bring someone else into the business, how do you value the business at that point in time so that you've got a vague idea of a fair market rate for the person, let's say, who wants to buy into the business? How much do they pay? Again, you can put thought into that right from square one and say, right, we're, go we're always going to base the value of the business on uh, a percentage of the profits it's making or a percentage of the turnover or how many customers you've got or whatever. And of course, the most common thing that you're going to use an exit plan or an exit strategy for is if you ever sell the business. Are you going to decide in advance, yes, it's at least on the cards. What if you've got a business partner who never, ever wants to sell the business, but you don't find that out for five years' time? What if you've always had it at the back of your mind that you're building up the business to potentially sell it and it's going to become part of your pension pot later down the line, whereas your business partner never ever wants to sell it and he wants to always hand it down to his uh, his children or to his family. If you've never discussed that, you've been working on a business that you're diametrically opposed to how it's going to function and you've been working on that business, building it up from square one, only to find out five or ten years down the line that you've hit an absolute stalemate situation because, as I say, your business partner's refusing to sell his shares. So at least have it on the table that you're both agreeing that at some point down the line you might want to sell the thing because that's a fairly fundamental thing that you need to be on the same page about from square one. 
And by the way, any business can be bought or sold. You would not believe the sort of businesses that I've seen bought and sold over the years. So don't think it won't apply to you. We'll talk a little bit more about potentially selling your business in a future episode because it's quite an in-depth one that. So don't forget to hit subscribe. And I know it's quite a dark subject if we're talking about people passing away and then families having to take over potentially the running of a business that they might not want anything to do with. But just imagine that you have passed away and now your loved ones are left with this problem to sort out. Just think about how stressed they already are just dealing with your death and funeral plans and like just the general awfulness of the whole situation. And now add on top of that the fact that they've got to somehow sort out this business that they know nothing about. Obviously you could incorporate something into your will, but it could be something as simple just as a one sheet piece of paper signed by you and your business partner that explains what you would both like to happen in the event of someone passing away. And just imagine how much weight that takes off the shoulders of your family when they find that piece of paper and it's like, oh look, they've already decided what's gonna happen, we know exactly what to do, it's all spelled out on here. Imagine that sense of relief for your loved ones. And as I say, just on a less morbid note, what if you just wanna do something else? It's easy to put together a quick bullet point list of a few of the fundamental concepts of what could potentially happen to your business, how you would wind things up, key information about suppliers, bank accounts, who you would need to inform. For example, have you got access to your website to put a, a notice on your website? You'd be amazed at how many businesses don't. They've always relied on a web company and then that web company's gone bust two years ago and you can't even update your own website to say the business is shutting down. What about access to your social media profiles? All of that, you can include that in a little bullet point list of things that you might want to consider as part of your exit plan. Coming back to James and Paul and their business, as I say, what they could have done is put a shareholders agreement in place. They both would have signed it. They would have decided exactly what was gonna to happen to their shares in the event of one of them passing away. There would be no ambiguity whatsoever. And as a result, James could have kept the business running. But as I say, things didn't work out like that. 50% of the business ended up being owned by a person who he wanted nothing to do with and knew nothing about drum shops. Now, I can't tell you exactly what you need to put in your exit plan, because obviously it's gonna be unique to your business and your circumstances. As per usual, I'm not in any way qualified to give you any form of accountancy advice, and this absolutely, definitely is not legal advice. I would suggest if you're really serious about this, there's two ports of call that you need to think about. First of all is to have a chat with your accountant when you set your business up. For example, if you set up a limited company, speak to them about setting up a shareholders agreement that spells out a few things that would be relevant to your business because they'll probably be quite familiar with putting that kind of thing together. If your accountant looks at you blankly when you ask for a shareholders agreement, then I would also suggest that you speak to a solicitor and try and get some legal advice on the matter. Obviously, whether or not you go down the accountant route or the solicitor route or both, there's gonna be some costs involved, but trust me, those costs will be a lot less than leaving it for five or 10 years down the line and running into a situation that just literally cannot be resolved. I would also suggest you have a look into things like key personnel insurance as well. That can be really useful if you've got members of your team where the business simply can't operate if they weren't there anymore. And finally, if all of that sounds like too much effort, at least keep it in the back of your mind to always have an exit plan. Have a little think about what if the worst happens, what are you gonna do? So at this stage, you're probably terrified and wondering how on earth you sort all this stuff out. And that's good since it means you're already ahead of the curve. If you're not terrified, then I suggest you re-watch the first half of this video. As a starting point, I would suggest you just do a bit of a search for legal professionals who have a background in sorting this sort of stuff out. So what on earth do you search for, I hear you ask? Well, personally, if I was part of a partnership, in other words, self-employed in partnership with other self-employed people, as opposed to through a limited company, then what you need to search for is a partnership agreement. 
you should find multiple law firms who know all about creating such things. And it's always worth asking your accountant for a recommendation as well, because this won't be the first time they've come across this. On the other hand, if you're running a business through a limited company, which is probably going to be the more popular way of doing things if there's more than one of you, then there's two things you need to get your head around to get things moving, and those are a cross-option agreement and a shareholders agreement. I'll come back to what those are in a minute, but the good news is that you might not even need to bother with either of those, as it might already be covered in your Articles of Association. Remember that 30 page document you shoved at the back of the filing cabinet when your company was first set up? Yes, that. The Articles of Association are basically the rule book for your limited company. They're public and if you can't find them in your filing cabinet of doom, you can download them from company's house at any time. Just do a search for your own limited company and download the company formation documents. Now if you're a bit of a tightwad and opted for the cheapest possible company formation option, then you may just be using the model articles provided for free by the government. These are known as the Companies Act 2006 model articles and are the legal minimum to get a company up and running. You can actually download them from the gov.uk website, I'll include a link in the description below. However, if you or your accountant paid nominally more for your company formation, then you may be using special non-standard articles that already deal with a lot of these problems. So for example, here's a company formation agent used by a lot of accountants, and as you can see, their basic package just uses the model articles, whereas for £37.60, they'll provide special articles that fix a lot of these common problems with the free articles. They actually don't recommend using the free model articles for anything other than name protection and dormant companies. Anyway, this is where a legal professional earns their crust. They'll read through your articles of association and tell you to either change them or put a separate agreement in place to cover some of the eventualities we mentioned earlier. And the nice thing about having an agreement separate to your articles of association is that it doesn't need to be made public on company's house. So I briefly touched on it earlier, but for a limited company there are two agreements that are commonly used. A cross-option agreement generally only deals with shareholder death. It grants a call option to purchase the dead person's shares at market value. This also grants the dead person's representatives a put option to sell the shares. Generally none of this is mandatory, hence the word option, and a life insurance policy is generally taken out at the same time to cover the costs of purchasing these shares so that you're not out of pocket. A shareholders agreement on the other hand is generally a much broader reaching document. It will probably include a cross option agreement and may also have additional points such as a general exit strategy from the company, for example if a business partner wants to leave. In both cases, you also need to align everything with the shareholder's wills. So for example, you need to make sure there's nothing in the person's will that conflicts with what's been put in the shareholder's agreement. So it's a good idea to sort those in parallel with all of this. Of course, there's also tax implications to consider, for example, inheritance tax, not to mention anything that might be covered in employment contracts if you have them. It can all get very complicated very quickly, and that's why for any serious business, you really need professional help with all this. Also bear in mind that at the time of someone's death, the executors of the estate will have a personal responsibility to make sure everything is correctly distributed to the beneficiaries. So if you say the company is worth X and the family of the shareholder who died says it's worth Y, then that puts the executor in a very tricky position since they're potentially personally liable if they distribute things wrongly. Just remember, death triggers a bunch of actions that are beyond your control from tax liabilities through to share transfers and of course dealing with family members who probably aren't in the best frame of mind to make good decisions. If no thought has been put into this, then the whole process can drag on for years and cost tens of thousands in legal fees. On the other hand, if things are carefully planned out in advance, then the whole process can be wrapped up quite quickly with minimal stress. And at a difficult time, this is generally a much better option for everyone involved. 
So folks, I hope you found that useful. As I say, this is not legal advice, but hopefully it's enough to just kind of get you thinking about the subject and maybe it's a bit of a starting point. If you're not aware, this channel is completely independently funded. We're not owned by some bigger organisation or anything like that. So by supporting the channel via the member area on the Small Business Toolbox website, you're helping me to create more videos like this and hopefully they'll be useful on your small business journey. And by the way, if you can't be bothered signing up on the members area, but you do want to support the channel, you can also head over to Patreon as well. Links to the members area and Patreon down in the description below. For now, folks, let us know what you think in the comments. Let us know of situations that you've run into or potential disasters that you might have avoided. If you think of any other kind of scenarios and ideas that might be beneficial for people coming up with an exit plan or exit strategy, please post those down in the comments below as well. For now, folks, I hope that this has been enough just to trigger the thought of developing an exit plan. If you're new to this channel, do hit subscribe. It would be great to have you on board. For now, all the very best of luck on your small business journey, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.